to uh, Professor Yong Jong Kim for inviting me. And I think uh, uh, every location looks very familiar to me, so it means I visited this place a lot of time. So I enjoy it all the time. So one more so, time. Yeah, in two weeks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so today uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, viscosity method in homogenization. So first, uh, let me give you the outline of the talk. And basically our talk, what is a homogenization? There are two words, right? Viscosity method and the homogenization. So first I'm going to introduce the concept of the uh, homogenization and then I will discuss uh, homogenization through the, some examples in 1D and multi-D and also I will introduce the uh, traditional method for uh, homogenization. And then I will introduce uh, what is the viscosity method and then we will uh, play around the uh, viscosity method in the uh, flame propagation. And uh, there are lots of applications, but uh, today I just choose the flame propagation to uh, grab the concept of viscosity solutions and the uh, application to the homogenization. And uh, so let me start with this picture. Let's say if you look at the uh, wall and any materials, even your seat, then as you uh, look at very close, then you have a lot of oscillations. So somehow, let's say uh, the, all, the periodicity is a 0.1, then you're going to have this picture. So then now you look at the, your picture or materials so a little bit far away, then your scale get, goes smaller. Then your periodicity somehow gets smaller. Then as epsilon goes to zero, then your material looks more and more smooth. And somehow homogenized, then it looks a very smooth surface. So somehow at a very small scale, you have uh, some physics and then you're going to have a PD. Then as epsilon goes to zero, then you're going to end with uh, some equation, which is, is uh, satisfied at the first approximation of the uh, solutions. So uh, if you look at the uh, solution, uh, uh, the next example will clarify. So basically, the issue is, uh, well, at a small scale, you're going to have a physics and corresponding PD, and let's say, you have a very small scale, uh, large scale, then what's going to be the physics, the main physics, and the equation? So that's the question. So then, so each part is uh, composed of these small cells. And this cell is very important. Too. And then uh, x is the, uh, our standard variable. So it is a uh, large variable or macroscopic variable. But if you, uh, uh, look at the picture, then you have a very small scale, and then this y variable will, will really describe the small scale. So then we say it's a fast variable or microscopic variables. So if you want to see what's going to happen in each very small tiny cell, you need to look at the y variable. And if you want to see the, what's going on in the larger picture, then you look at the x variable. Okay, so that's why we call it macroscopic and microscopic variables. So then, uh, let me start with uh, one dimensional problems. Uh, so this is a standard second order PD, uh, ODE, and uh, uh, this one is uh, really tells the diffusion. And uh, so simply this ODE with the boundary value problems. So you have a unit interval, it is zero on one side, and it is one at the other side. And uh, let's say we, you solve this ODE, then you know how to solve it, right? simply take an integral at each side, and then you're going to have a constant, then you divide that constant with this coefficient, and take an integral again, then basically you end up with the solution. Then I uh, manipulate the solution and decompose the, my solution into two parts, x and this part. And if you look at it very carefully, and this one can be written in this form, and w is bounded. So in the other words, if you epsilon goes to zero, so in the other words, you are looking at the picture far and far away, then this part basically goes to zero, and the limit will be this x, okay? So in the other words, at each epsilon problem, your solution has this first order approximation, which is the main part, with the small oscillations. So 
And this is an epsilon problem. It will be composed with two parts and the limit solution and these correcting terms. Why do I call it correct? Because if, let's say I have a limit solution, then I want to correct it so that the corrected solution is the solution of epsilon problem. Okay? So in other words, let's say I do have this one, then if I add a corrector, then it will be a uh, epsilon solution. So this one is a very important philosophy because uh, you know the limit solution is a special one because it's a limit of epsilon problems. So you can imagine a lot of different uh, graphs. Then some of them will be the limit of the epsilon problem. How can you find out that one is a limit of epsilon problems. The limit one should be able to be corrected to be epsilon problems. So the limit solution is a very special graph which is correctable by adding corrector. Okay? Such a correctability condition really gives you the equation satisfied the limit solution. So that's the basic storyline. Okay, so then the limit one satisfies some uh, coefficient which is effective coefficient. So then, well, somehow this one is oscillating, but the, at the limit, it will have effective diffusion. Okay, because uh, at each epsilon scale, it looks like it's very different materials, but if you look at the far away, then it has one diffusion. Or conductivity, one conductivity. Okay, so then what is the conductivity? It will be this number. And that is a, not a simple average of the, your diffusion term. It is a harmonic average. That is a very interesting phenomenon. And if you look at the picture, uh, the storyline is the following. So you have a diffusion or a different conductivity at different location. It's just like oscillating things. Then your solution will have this one. So it is a, as you see, the, there are very small oscillations, but when epsilon goes to zero, then you end up with this uh, straight line, which will satisfy uh, this effective equation. So the question is, uh, at each epsilon problem, you do have this one, then at the limit, and then you have an epsilon solution, then you do have a limit, and what is the equation satisfied with this limit? And that is this one. So somehow, this is the uh, physics at a large scale satisfy the uh, main term, main average. Okay. All right. Then, uh, simply we can extend this uh, uh, equation into a higher dimension. So, let's say you have uh, different uh, uh, materials at the, uh, which is uh, distributed periodically. Okay. Then you can ask uh, what is the uh, property of that material you may ask the conductivity or diffusions of their materials, okay? So then, uh, that is these questions. It's just a higher dimensional question. And then, the main question is the following. Is there any method to find out uh, homogenized equation heuristically? So, proofing is a different story, but at least uh, we should guess what's gonna be, right? So, that's the heuristic computation. And that is very important. If you look at the, uh, your solution, then it is much easier to prove it, right? So, uh, so, and then I will tell you how to see the limit solutions in some cases. And then the next question is, okay, now through the heuristic computation, you guess the what's gonna be uh, homogenized equation at the limit. Then the uh, next question is how are we going to justify to the limit satisfied the possible homogenized equation? Is a justification or mathematical proof of things? Okay, so then uh, let me introduce a multi-scale expansion method to find out the limit solution heuristically. Okay, so this is an epsilon solution. As we observed before, there is a, a main order terms and then there is a small oscillation with a os uh, error, and that is a epsilon order terms. After that, there is a much smaller oscillation with a oscillation order epsilon scares, and so on. Okay, so then each solution has a two part. 
x variable part is a you know large scale variable, right? And then the other one is a, is a small oscillations, or is including the uh, small uh, uh, microscopic variables. So if this is a standard like a Taylor expansion with respect to epsilon. Okay. So then uh, we want to find each one. And the basically what we want to do is the, we want to find this one, first order term, and we want to find the equation satisfied this first order term. So, okay. So, now, uh, well, because uh, we are thinking about the PDE, we needed to take a differentiation of this uh, uh, function. So let's say you take a differentiation. Then, uh, well, this is a standard uh, differentiation in each function, then first you will take a differentiation in this x variable, and if you take a differentiation in this variable, one over epsilon will come out, and that is a differentiation with respect to this part, and that is y variable. So in the other words, the differentiation will be two part, standard uh, differentiation, and the differentiation with respect to y variable, and one over epsilon terms. And uh, plug this function into our PD, okay? And there is one differentiation and another differentiation, okay? So just plug and expand it. And if you trust me, then you're gonna have these expansions, okay? So then there is a each operator, right? Like this and the other one, the second one, and the third one, okay? So you're gonna have this expansion. And then now, uh, we need to match each uh, two part. So first, uh, here, this term is one over epsilon square. When epsilon goes to zero, this one goes to infinity with order one over epsilon square. But if you look at the right hand side, there is no such term. So in the other words, this term will be zero. And also the second term will be zero. And third term will be equal to f. Okay, so, uh, okay. So now let's uh, try to understand what it means uh, uh, of the each equation. So we're gonna have three equations, okay, at least. Uh, so the first equation says, uh, okay, this is a leading order term, and uh, L1 operator is basically the standard operator that you considered. But this operator is with respect to uh, Y variable. It's a fast variable. So X variable is like a constant y variable is also, uh, really the variable that we consider. So then, so this one satisfies the equation. And then, uh, and then uh, let's say this is a global solution, periodic solution. This one really implies uh, uh, use of zero is a constant with respect to uh, x variable. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, y variable. And this is misprinting. Because uh, uh, the, that is the equation to the y variable, and the only possible solution is a constant solution. So therefore, the uh, use of zero satisfied this equation equal to zero, then use of zero is uh, constant with respect to y variable. So in the, it means use of zero depends only on x variables. Okay, so first approximation has no fast variables. Okay, and then the second equation tells you this one, and the, the, this is a learning equation, and then you have this term, and this term comes from the use of zero. It's the use of zero, and for one, first derivative of use of zero. So use of one will depends on the linearly on this part, is a gradient term of our solution. So then, well, basically we can solve it, then the, the solution will have this structure. So the first approximation will have the, my gradient term of the first uh, uh, general approximation and these correcting terms and the errors. And this term really are the correcting terms which we consider in 1D, okay? And it will satisfy this equation and it is a periodic one. Okay, so and this is the way to get use of one. And then now let's try to find the use of two. 
So the second approximation. So then, uh, uh, let's look at the L sub one, the operator again. The operator is, has a divergent structure. This is a summation, so it's a basically divergence of this vector field. So it is a divergence equation. And the, the divergence equation is a, uh, inauguration by part, okay? So then you of to satisfy the divergence equation with this right hand side. So, for example, let's say you have Laplace of U of Y is F of Y, and U is uh, periodic in Y variable, okay? So then if you take the integration of U of Y and DY, and f of y dy on the each cell, then you know the divergence theorem, right? And the gradient of u of y nu d sigma x, okay? So in the unit cell, you have gradient of u will have the same vector field because it's periodic. On the other hand, at this point, your nu is pointing this direction, but here, your nu is pointing the other direction. So basically, there is a cancellation between these two terms, and it happens here and there. So basically, this integral will be zero, okay? So if you want to have a periodic solution here, the integral of f is supposed to be zero, and this is a compatibility condition. Otherwise, you cannot have a periodic solution, okay? So why is a fast a variable? And many things is, happen so highly oscillating, but it is periodic. So in Y variable, the picture should be periodic. So in order to do that, uh, this right and the integral of this right hand side is supposed to be zero. Okay, just this region. And U sub two is a periodic in Y variable, in fast variable. So the integral of this one will be zero. In the other words, you end with this one. So, uh, I, I, yeah, there is a S sub two operator. So this is the right one. Okay. So then, uh, from here, uh, what do you get? So now I plug U sub one. U sub one is right here. Okay, and this is U sub zero. And if you plug this one here, and then what happens is you end up with this equation. And the u is the u sub zero, the first approximation. So let me go back to here. So you have u epsilon, and you expand it through the epsilon. It's a Taylor expansion. And uh, I want to find the solution equation for this one. And what you find is uh, this one is independent of this uh, first variable. That's the first one. And then the second one is uh, uh, the u sub one can be found through the equation and then it involves these correcting terms, correctors, okay? And then the existence of u sub two give you the compatibility condition and then that will give you the equation for the first one. So that's the standard story, okay? So basically the compatibility condition, the solvability so the value of this equation will give you compatibility condition, and then you have, uh, uh, if homogenized the solution, homogenized the equation for the limit. Okay. So, now, the next thing is a whole, well, that is a, well, like a heuristic computation. So you can guess the possible uh, equation for the limit. The next question is how can you justify uh, that uh, equation, right? Through rigorous proof, okay? So then <coughs> let me tell you the energy method. And this energy method is developed by Tata to justify the homogenized equation that we found out through the heuristic computation, okay? So then the, the difficulty is the following. So, now I multiply, uh, so let's go back to equation. This is the original equation, and then I multiply a test function, a smooth function to the left and the right, and take integration, and take integra 
relation by party here, then you will have this relationship. And then I want to send epsilon to uh, zero. Okay. So then the problem is this one is highly oscillating as a, uh, we observed in 1D, right? As epsilon goes to zero, conductivity is highly oscillating. And uh, the solution has an oscillation too, okay? So somehow two, these two solutions has an oscillation, high oscillation. And then the question is whether the multiple of these two solutions converge to somewhere. But generally, this is not true. If only one function has oscillation, then you can take a limit, okay? But these two functions have oscillation. That is the difficulty of these problems. And then Tata overcome that issue by thinking another oscillating test functions like this, okay? And this test function is designed through the collector. And the important thing is the following. So like, uh, You do have two vector fields here, okay? So then, uh, one is the sum of a sub i j x over epsilon, and I will think like this, uh, j epsilon, and then uh, this part has this correct part. So let's say this is correct, which has a oscillation. So then this is wj, okay? So then the important thing is, uh, this is a kind of gradient of something. So therefore, if you take a call of it, then it's gonna be zero, okay? And uh, what about the character? Character has uh, some equations, right? So if you had to take a divergence of uh, Aij and uh, let's say I and W sub J, so this is differentiation, then it's gonna be some nice function. So one of the easiest one could be the zero, let's say it's simplest. So in the other words, you have two oscillating things, two oscillating vectors, but the divergence, color of one is zero, and divergence of the other one is nice. Then there is a cancellation of oscillation. Then this, the product of these two things converges. That's a remarkable thing. Usually the product of two oscillating function never converge, but in this special case, it happens. So that, and we call it uh, compensated compactness. And that's the idea of the Tata, and he proved this heuristic computation, heuristic homogenized equation is actually the homogenized equation satisfied the limit. Okay? Okay. And uh, the other uh, understanding is called the gamma convergence. And then uh, the idea is the following. So the solution of the epsilon problem is the minimizer of the energy, okay? And then as epsilon goes to zero, the energy is oscillating a little bit. And then uh, it will go to the some of the limit energy, satis uh, where the, our limit solution is the uh, uh, minimizer of the limit energy, okay? So that's the story. So instead of looking at the PD, he looked at uh, energy and tried to find uh, what is the limit of this epsilon energy, okay? And then, so somehow our solution tried to be a minimizer at each point and everywhere. Somehow it tried to be minimizer and even each cells, okay? So somehow he looked at this uh, uh, effective energy. Okay, what you do is, if you give me any gradient, and we look at that, uh, this energy, and then, so actually this is a character, okay? And then, if my, I look at the, my limit solution, at a very low, small scale, it's just like a plane, okay? And then I try to correct it through the, this character, and then the character will be achieved so that the, even this small cell, this energy will be minimized at the, my collector, okay? And then uh, if you plug this one, then you end up with your effective equation, effective energy, okay? So then 
the question is the following. So at each epsilon, you have uh, epsilon energy, and you will oscillate. And then through the idea of a collector, we found out uh, effective energy at the limit. So then the question is, uh, uh, how can you say uh, certain energy is converging to the other energy? OK. So then the thing is, uh, we are just looking at the energy minimizers, and the, uh, we are not interested at the, the other part of the energy. So now, like, uh, just think about uh, certain energy. Let's say it is uh, this shape, and then this is a limit one, right? And you are approaching this energy with like this, and uh, like this, and so on, right? But we are not interested in the, this part. We are just interested in the energy minimizers. Because energy minimizer is the solution of the PD. Okay? So instead of talking about the all part of the energy, and then they looked at the, uh, the energy minimizers, and then they introduced this kind of gamma convergence of the energy. So what is the gamma convergence of the energy? And uh, the gamma convergence of the energy really interested in the energy minimizer. So what it says is the following. So if I look at the uh, limit of uh, any energy, then the, it will be greater than or equal to energy of this limit. Okay. So it's a low semi-continuity. And that is very important to find the energy minimizer. And then the next one is a kind of realizations. So if you, you just look at this part, then one of the possible scenarios is you do have a certain energies, but the, the limit, they have this one. So and each epsilon, you do have energy here, but this energy satisfies this inequality because it's greater than energy of this one. But they are nothing. Uh, they are not related to each other at all, okay? So you, we need to say somehow this linear energy uh, touched the, these pictures very tightly, okay? So that is the second part. So the second part means uh, if you have uh, any function, and if you look at the energy of V, then uh, you can find the use of epsilon, and this energy can be a limit of these epsilon energies. So in the other words, the energy of this part is very tightly touched, uh, this part. Okay. So and this is a kind of gamma convergence. And then uh, what it showed is the this energy will converge to this limit energy through the gamma convergence. And the, uh, the energy minimizer of this one satisfies uh, the Euler Lagrange equation corresponding to this energy, and that is basically this equation. Okay? So to get this equation, he looked uh, at the energy and uh, looked at the gamma convergence. Okay? So that's a different story. And then now uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, viscosity solutions. Uh, and then energy comes uh, from the, uh, so there are some class of PDs corresponding to energy. So uh, if you look at the Euler Lagrange equation, always uh, it has, a that, well, if you look at the minimizing this energy, and then you're going to have a vector field with respect to this variable and gradient of U and the graph divergence of this is J. Okay? So now, uh, if you look at the energy and uh, look at the energy minimizer, then the energy minimizer always satisfies this type of equation, and it has a divergent structure. But there are very different equations which doesn't have such a structure, so therefore compensated the compactness energy method and the uh, gamma convergence method doesn't work. So people developed a different method called viscosity solutions. And then the, the idea of viscosity solution is very interesting. So, well, this is a very complex, but uh, I'll give you a very key idea through the simple examples. 
So let's say you have a function and straight line and straight line satisfies this equation. Okay? And then, but let's say uh, uh, let uh, if uh, what if u is just continuous? So you just have a continuous function. Then how can you say the second differential of the continuous function is zero? So you cannot take a second differential, right? So one of the way is. Uh, if you touch this one with any smooth function, then what happens here? And here, the second differential is uh, less than or equal to zero. And whenever you touch this picture from the above, then it will satisfy this one. Okay? So if these two conditions are satisfied, then there is only one straight lines. For example, if your picture bend it a little bit, then I can touch it from below. Uh, so I can touch it from above, but uh, this one has a negative. It violated this condition, right? So why? Because it is not a straight line, okay? So instead of taking a second differential of the solution, uh, we are looking at the touching polynomials or touching smooth function and they give the sign of it, okay? So if we touch it from below, then it is less than or equal to zero, and if we touch it from above, second differential is greater than or equal to zero. And second differential is just like uh, your partial differential equations. So whenever you touch it from below, uh, above, then it will satisfy this equation, and just like this. Okay, so then, uh, now we do have uh, oscillating the, uh, uh, data and uh, then our solution will oscillate then uh, we want to see the limit and then we want to find the equation satisfy the limit as we did okay so first thing is uh, uh, regular theory says if you have a, a finite uh, so let's say an infinite norm of use of epsilon is bounded in the other words your picture is just a bounded picture then the regular theory says in a smaller ball, actually your function is hold a continuous. It's a continuous function, but it's better than continuous. Then you can extract the limit because it has a nice picture, then you, you know there is a limit. Now we want to find the equation satisfy the limit. Okay? So then uh, we are going to look at the, uh, the same story. Okay? So now, uh, Let's say uh, 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 this is an equation for the corrector. So let me tell you the next page. That will be better. So for example, uh, let's say you do have a quadratic polynomial, and the second differential is uh, the matrix M sub i j, and uh, the first uh, linear part and uh, uh, constant part. And this is a second order uh, polynomial. Okay. And then we want to try to correct this one. In the other words, I want to add a corrector. And then I expect this one satisfied epsilon problems, okay, as we did. So the, our limit graph is a very special one. It's different from very general graphs. Why? So because it's a limit. In the other words, it, if it is a mini picture, you, sh you should be able to correct it so that it is a solution of epsilon problems. So that's the main philosophy. So you do have a limit picture, then if it is a limit picture, you should uh, be able to correct it by adding corrector, okay? So it means uh, corrected one satisfy the original equation, okay? Then you plug in here, then the first differential goes to, uh, first order terms goes to zero, and you just have the second order terms, okay? The coefficient of the second uh, order. Then you do have this one. So now we want to, uh, we said it is correctable. In the other words, there is a corrector, okay? Existence periodic function W is crucial. So the question comes to this one. 
So you do have a matrix, symmetry matrix, then can you find W satisfying this equation? Okay, so that is corresponding to the correct ability of this one. Okay, so then, so we want to solve the, uh, the equation, we want to find the correct with the general right on the side. So then we think in different way. Let's say there is any n. Can you find the lambda so that there is a periodic solution? So then you can find such lambda depends on this n. Okay? So then, and now we wanna, so, now we wanna, this lambda is zero. In the other words, there are many general quadratic polynomials but if you expect that this right hand side is zero, then this value is zero, okay? So, uh, this is the story. So, my quadratic polynomial has a mij, and uh, well, if you plug any mij, then you can make a quadratic polynomials. And there is a special quadratic polynomial, which is a correctable, okay? So that is corresponding to this one should be zero. Okay, so this is a constraint on the, uh, this uh, uh, matrix. And that one will be the basically your homogenized equations. Okay, so the correctability of your limit function will give you the equation satisfied the limit because it is kind of a constraint. Okay, so that's the idea. And then proof is, uh, it goes through the viscosity method, but uh, let me skip it. Oh, yeah, well, I, I got really surprised because I prepared the other part. And then, <laughs> so, uh, thank you anyway. So, this is an introduction to the flame propagation. Flame propagation is the following story. So, if you have a look at the fire, then there is a burning materials, okay? Then fire will spread it out. So, in the other words, this is, you will tell you the amount of reaction materials. Then flame is right here, okay? And this is a burnt germ, material was burnt already. And then you have a fresh germ where you do have some materials. And the flame is propagating in this direction, okay? So then, so the modal equation for this phenomenon is called the reaction diffusion equation. And this is a standard heat equation, will give you heat diffusion, and this one will give you a reaction. So fire things. And then when reaction happens, so your value goes down. You, if you forget this one, then use of T goes to, is negative, it means your value is going down because of this reaction term. So all of the value goes down because of reaction, so in the other words, your solution is receding. So your solution looks like this, and it looks like this later. And uh, this dot already tells you the, uh, the size of the uh, flame front. So there is a reaction happens here and at delta region, okay? So when delta goes to zero, then you end with uh, heat diffusion here and the reaction on the, this uh, right here, low dimensional surface. And this is a free boundary condition kind of. And then uh, if you look at the 1D problems, uh, Basically, the solution will have this shape, and then uh, the speed, this really tells you the speed of the solution. So it's a receding, and the speed looks like this. And what is this? So the first uh, F sub zero really tells you the reaction rate. So this one tells you reaction rate. So if you do have different materials, then they do have different reaction. So some material, uh, is a very easy to burn, so you have a higher reaction rate, so then F sub zero will be very large. And if some material uh, has a very slow reaction, then your value will be very small. And also, uh, this A is a kind of a thickness of your materials. So if your material uh, has a very small thickness, it burns out quickly, right? And if you do have a, lo a lot of materials, then speed of the flame is very slow. So basically, this relationship really uh, captures such a phenomenon. Oh, I see. Now what is going on? 
Yeah. I lost to their files. It's my, oh, <laughs> sorry about it. Uh, I we compiled it, and I lost the other part. But uh, uh, I do have it right here. So, <laughs> yeah, I, that's why I'm very confused at the beginning, because I made a 20-something, but it uh, turns out uh, 18. So OK, what can I do? So. Um, let's see. Uh, I hope uh, I have another file here. So I do have it. Uh, oh, it's still 18. <laughs> oh, what a shame. <laughs> uh, OK. So, uh, well, we, unfortunately, we do it. Uh, so, okay. So I will use a blackboard then. So I'll give you the idea of the problem quickly. Yeah. So. You are already Swiss guy? Yeah, so uh, what I considered was uh, uh, this uh, reaction diffusion equation, uh, epsilon, x over epsilon, and the u. So basically, the equation is depends on the epsilon and delta, and the uh, vectors of delta, so f, delta, u, epsilon, and delta. So then, uh, as t goes to infinity, uh, we do have these stationary solutions. Okay. And when delta goes to zero, delta is the weakness of the front, flame front. And delta goes to zero, we end up with Laplace equation and gradient of u square is 2m. So let's say fx of epsilon. It's kind of. So in omega, where u is greater than zero, and on boundary of this one. So then, uh, the interesting phenomenon is the following. So if I look at this equation, so the simple case is the following. So let's say you do have value is one here, 
and try to solve this equation. So then the equation says, oh, this is the drum, the fresh drum, and this is a burnt drum. And here, it should satisfy this condition. In the other words, gradient is f x of epsilon. So u sub x square is f x of epsilon right here. Okay? But this f is oscillating. Okay? So at some epsilon, you can take this one. At the other one, you can take this one, and so on. Because it has different values. Okay? So actually, there are multiple solutions. Okay? At this point, you will take this value, and then you use the slope, and so on. And then the problem of this one has is there are multiple solutions. Okay? So then, now I'm going to take a homogenization of these solutions. As epsilon goes to zero, your solution is basically highly oscillating. Right? Then there is no limit. Right? So therefore, you need to select some solution which you are interested. And there are three interesting solutions. One of them is energy minimizer. Okay? And then the limit, so this is epsilon and delta, epsilon and delta. And then there are three possible solutions. So the, the smallest solution, and the largest solution, and the energy minimizer. And the each one satisfies different, grad, different, uh, grad, uh, different equations. On here, the use of x square is the average of f. And this one is the largest solution. So you will try to take uh, the smallest slope gradient. Okay? So then this one has, so star square has the maximum, the minimum of f. And then the smallest solution takes the largest slope, largest reaction rate. Okay? So we have three possible, maybe there could be another solutions. So these three solutions are very interesting solutions. Smallest one, largest one, and the energy minimizer. Okay? So the, why this smallest solution is very important. So the reason is the following. So you do have uh, three solutions. So let's say this is, is it, this is uh, parallel flow, and this is initial initial data. Okay, and this one is your initial data. And let it follow this parallel equation. Let it go. Okay, as t goes to infinity, it will converge to somewhere, but it never cross this one, because this one is also a solution. Oh, that one is a solution of this one, but also it is a solution of this one. So there is a comparison between these two solutions. So this one will converge to somewhere, and then it will be a stationary solution, which is independent of the time, but it never cross this one. But we know there is no stationary solution below this one. So in other words, this one will converge to this one. So if you initial data, is far away from your energy minimizer, then you never see this one. You will see the smallest solution. For example, let's say you start with a very large solution, and the frame is, is here, and let it go. Then at, as t goes to infinity, you will converge to this one. So it's nothing to do with your energy minimizer. So standard, well, the previous method, like energy method, or gamma convergence, always look at this energy minimizers. But in physics, some solution is nothing to do with your energy minimizer. It will be related with the smallest solution or largest solution. And that is the uh, kind of viscosity solution which I talked about. Okay? So that's why you need a different idea to capture this phenomenon. Okay. So then, uh, then now let's go back to our traveling wave. 
So let's look at the 1D problem. So you start with this one, and you do have oscillating reaction rate. Okay? So then, our picture is oscillating and oscillating and so on. But it is receding somehow. It is oscillating. And the speed is fast if you have high reaction materials. And if you have some uh, low reaction materials, so then slow speed will slow down. And faster, slow, faster, slow, and so on. It's oscillating. The question is, what is the effective speed? Okay? So the interesting thing is the following. The uh, speed is fast, and speed is slow, fast, slow, fast, and slow. Then what is the, uh, the, this is the speed at epsilon, and what is the effective one as epsilon goes to zero? And then, the, and then we may think, well, it is really related with, or well, there is a related reaction rate, okay? Then standard thinking says, okay, there is an average, and then the average reaction rate will give you uh, average speed. Then is it this, this one? Then says, it's no. Okay, why? So let me give you two examples. So let's think of the stationary solution is right here. Then, as we know, there are three solutions. And if it, it is receding, then it ends up with this one, right? So now, your receding front really look at the largest reaction, smallest reaction rate. So this largest solution has a uh, max of F, OK? A minimum of F. Sorry about it. So in the other words, your receding front maybe look at the minimum reaction rate. Okay? So there is another argument. So let's say you have a periodic materials, and then this one is a not burning. Okay? So there is no, uh, there is a certain material uh, which cannot be burned. Then what's going to happen to your flame? It will stop right here because it, there is no burning at all. Okay, so here the reaction rate F is zero. Okay, because there is no burning. So in the other words, your receiving front look at the minimum of the reaction rate, not the average. Okay, so then question is if you have a multi-dimensional. So in 1D, it is easy to find the minimum reaction rate. It is simply of F. Okay, but in the higher dimension, your front is moving, and then your free boundary front of the flame is oscillating. Okay? The question is, what is the uh, minimum reaction rate? Okay? So then uh, there is uh, some theory, and then you really need to look at the, your stationary solution as we did the 1D. Right? And this is stationary solution is important. Okay? Stationary flame is important. And then we look at, we find out the station of flame right here, and then look at the minimum reaction rate. And that reaction rate really give you the speed of the front. And well, I do have a numeric computations, but it's kind of shame, so I'm so sorry, but that's the end of the story. Thank you. <laughs>